This has been May, and I want to thank you for joining us again as we seek the old paths. Jeremiah 6, verse 16, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. We, again, are trying to call people back to the old paths, and we are going through our Bibles. That's our source of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, verse 17. And so we are studying our Bibles. We're using a, uh, a tool, you might say. And that is a series of books by Brother Bob and Sandra Waldron. This book is called How Long, O Lord? And it covers um, sort of the rest of the Bible. We, we went through all the way through Paul's letters. And then we, the last three times we were together, we talked about how we got our Bibles. Who decided what would be in our Bibles? We have 66 books. Who decided? And so we talked about that. And now we're getting back to really our Bibles. And, and uh, so this time we're going to be studying the book of James. Now, it won't be verse by verse. It'll be an overview. But I hope it would be sufficient to give us a good idea about what that book is all about. Again, our goal is to seek the old past. That's where we will find rest for our souls. That's the good way. And so let's get into our book. By the way, this is uh, lesson four, the way we have the book divided. Uh, this would be James chapter one and through part of chapter three, down to about verse 12. And so the epistle of James, it is a wonderful book full of great lessons that we need today. In fact, James is the earliest of the non-Pauline epistles. In other words, it's the earliest one that Paul did not write. But even saying that, it's kind of difficult to date the book. You've got to rely on the internal evidence of the letter and the witness of the church fathers. We talked about the church fathers. They're not inspired, but they've written a lot, and they help us to, to have a better timetable. There's a church historian named Eusebius, and he really gives us a lengthy description of the life of James. He, Eusebius says he was called the just. He was also called justice. And after Paul's appeal to Caesar, and, and Caesar saw that, um, the, you know, the Jews saw that they were not going to be able to trap Paul, they turned their attention to James and their hatred toward James. And so this was about the time Festus died and before uh, Albinus became governor. So it's around A.D. 62. So again, according to the church historian Eusebius, around A.D. 62, when Paul was a prisoner in Rome, see, other things were going on. Now, now Luke didn't record it for us in the book of Acts, and, and Paul gives us limited information in his writings. But you've got 11 other uh, 12 other apostles beside Paul. And so the, the Jews, it is told, asked James to stand in a wing of the temple and tell the people the truth about Jesus. But James doesn't say what they want him to say. He starts telling the truth, okay, about Jesus is who he says he is. Well, they are angry, and the priests and the Pharisees, they throw James to the ground and said, let's stone James the just and James prayed, I entreat thee, O Lord God and Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I can think of two other times that's recorded. Stephen, around Acts chapter 7, said that as they stoned him, and Jesus, while on the cross, said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, they continue to stone James. And then a priest of the sons of uh, Rechab said, Cease, what are you doing? Justice is praying for for you. It didn't stop everybody. A man from the crowd, a fuller or someone who washed clothes, smashed James' head with the club he used to beat out the clothes that he washed. The Jews buried James near the temple where his tombstone, the, it is said, remained until the time at least of the writing of Eusebius. It, it can be little doubt that James is the physical brother of Jesus. He's listed in Matthew 13, verse 55, when they were saying about Jesus, is not this the carpenter's son? 
Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? So James was one of the Lord's brothers. We also find Paul mentioning him in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. Paul says of him that he was a prominent member of the church. So James went to having no faith in Jesus, his own brother, but he didn't believe he was who he said he was at one point, to being one of the leaders of the church following the Lord's resurrection. Now, students can disagree about whether the book of James was written before the Jerusalem conference, which was about A.D. 49, or shortly before his death, which was in A.D. 62, 63. We don't have a lot of evidence to base a decision on. Mayer argues that for the early date, and then says, well, that's because of a point of doctrine, really. And it was really an error in Mayer's own understanding of this doctrine. Now, see, people will come up with their idea of what something ought to be and the, the way uh, a teaching ought to be. And then when they come across things that they don't harmonize with it, then they try to discredit the source of the information that doesn't agree with them. So Mayer says that the early date would put the, this book ahead of Paul's books of Romans and Galatians. He claims that Paul teaches salvation by faith alone, and James would not have dared contradict him. So he thinks James wrote before Paul. Well, actually, Paul and James taught the same thing. Paul taught that you're justified by faith and not by works alone. James taught you're justified by works and not by faith alone. They're just coming at it from two different sides. Faith and works go together. And, and so again, it, it's, it's a matter, you, you see again in the, in your, on your screen there is one of the advantages of, I hope, hope you can see that on your screen that in, in the writing there. Both faith and works are obedient actions and necessary in God's plan for salvation. Throughout the scripture, it's not faith alone. It is not works alone. How do you know you have faith? It's by your works. How can someone else know you have faith? They see your works. A person's works will show their faith. And so the two have to go hand in hand. They do not exist alone. Now, our study concludes that the book was probably written around AD 60. Reasons for that, there were many more Christians among the 12 tribes which are of the dispersion by A.D. 60. That's who James writes the book to. This would place James's writing about the same time Luke wrote his account of the life of Christ, the book of Luke, around A.D. 58, A.D. 60. Paul would still have been in prison in Caesarea on his way to Rome in the ship that wrecked. So these things are overlapping each other. Now, James died before the persecution from, from uh, Rome and led by Nero, the emperor. He died before that started. So when he does mention persecution, as he will somewhat, it had to be the persecution that came from the Jews. They were the first ones to persecute the church. They had Jesus crucified, and they were trying to stop the church. Our faith can be tried in more ways than just physical persecution. Now, I'm thankful that as I'm recording this, I'm not worried about somebody breaking in and saying you can't do that. When we have church services, I don't really worry about somebody breaking in, like especially the government. That's, yeah, we know there are crazies out there, and you've got to be aware of that. But I'm talking about persecution to try to stop your faith, especially by the government. I'm thankful we don't have that. James did not experience it to the extent others will later, but it was enough that it cost him his life. Now, again, James, when he's writing the book, is to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. Now, he could have been meeting sort of spiritual Israel, all the saints, but more likely he was addressing faithful Jews. 
It didn't matter where they lived, but it, they were many faithful Jews. He did most of his work, though, in Jerusalem. And he focused on Christian Jews both there and abroad. But he's writing to those believing Jews. Paul focused on the Gentiles, but we find James focused on Jewish believers. You know, in Acts chapter 21 and verse 20, it says that when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. How many thousands of the Jews had believed is what he's saying there in Acts 21, verse 20. So there were a lot of Jewish Christians. That's, that's was, that was the beginning point for Christianity to the Jews. In fact, Paul was saying in Romans 1, verse 16, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Again, th there are those who, who want to somehow show a conflict between Paul and James. They say that James' emphasis on works counteracts the teaching of the Apostle Paul with his emphasis on faith. But there's no conflict between them. Don't you think if that were true, that Paul was teaching one thing and James teaching something else, they probably would not get along that well? But we find in Galatians chapter 2 and verse 9, Paul says this of his own experience with James. And when James, Cephas, and John, who had a reputation as pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we would go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. And so there was no disagreement. They gave them the right hand of fellowship. As Paul went about his work, then they went about their work. They were just focused on in, in different ways, but they were in very much in agreement. Now, various authorities, again, are still trying to make it not look like they agree. Martin Luther was one of the ones who really had a problem with the book of James. He called it a right strawy epistle. Again, see, Luther had decided that salvation was, was by faith alone. That was really an overreaction to the Catholic Church's teaching that you're saved by works alone. And so he went the other extreme, where neither extreme is right, works alone or faith alone. There, there is not a contradiction between Paul and James, but a true balance in dealing with the relationship between faith and works. The theme of this book is that the Christian life in all its aspects is to be an exercise of faith. Now, as you look at the book, each point is very straightforward, it's clear, it's very practical, as, as you'll see. I guess for a theme for the letter, we mentioned, count it a matter of joy, and through trials we learn faithfulness will make us complete. He talks about trials here, but he talks about completing our faith. If all we have is lip service, that's not a complete faith. We have to have a faith that acts a faith that shows up in some way other than we just give it lip service. And so as we start then in the book of James, we've looked already somewhat at the introduction. He wrote it in verse 1 to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. I love uh, starting in verse 8. If any of you lack wisdom, now I probably would, be safe to say all of us at different points in life feel like we lack wisdom. So what do you do? Ask God, who gives to all men freely. He won't reprove you for asking. Ask with confidence. If you don't ask with confidence, in and, and verse 7 he says, For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord, since he is a double-minded individual, unstable in all his ways. So he's like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. You don't know which way it's going to go. You know people like that? Our faith has to be of such a nature that we can ask in faith, that we can ask without doubting. That's part of the action that goes with our belief. The wise man in Proverbs said it this way in chapter 1, verse 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. <laughs> so true, isn't it? All true wisdom comes from God. If any 
lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. Well, that's where wisdom comes from. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. He holds the answers to the weighty questions of life. So begin your search for, uh, for wisdom by turning to God and his word for answers. Now, he, he goes into another subject in verse 9. It's very practical. So what do you do? You're, you're, let's say you're at church. And somebody comes in. Oh, and they're just dressed to the T. Nice looking, sharp. And then another person comes in. Looks like they might be homeless, maybe. As we might envision a person just dressed very shabbily and poorly kind of unkept. What if we show a difference there? Have we done right? James says, no, don't, don't do that. Um, let, let people know. Let the rich brother know. His riches don't mean anything to the Lord. And they don't need to mean anything to us either. And so we would be showing partiality, would we not? And so he said, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. You know, don't, don't be ashamed of it. Just know the Lord doesn't care if you don't have as much as the other person. Now, the same Greek word that's translated test and tempt, it's the same word. Both God and the devil place situations before man to see what they'll do. Now, there's a difference, though. God does so with the intent that man will succeed. Satan wants man to fail. He wants them to fall. God tries men to help their faith to grow. The devil tempts men to destroy their faith. And so we had that discussion down in verse 12 uh, and, and um, down through verse um, well, really through down through verse 18. So be careful about accusing God of tempting. God does not tempt man. So that's a very interesting passage. Again, we're, we're not going verse by verse, but just know that. Satan might be tempting you. God may be testing you. If God does it, it's for your good. If Satan does it, he wants you to fall. Pretty big difference, isn't it? Well, here's a way that we ought to be. Be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Man's wrath does not bring about the righteousness that God wants. You ever been sort of ashamed of what you said? Ever wished, man, I wish I had not said that. And so we need to be slow to speak, slow to wrath, but be quick to listen. And then he says, now you put away all moral filth and the spewing forth of all malicious disposition. Then no, don't, don't be that way. Sometimes we need to take a step back. Think a minute before we put our mouth in gear and say something we can't take back. Something that we might regret, maybe even from then on. And so then he talks about, in meekness, let the word become a part of you. It, it means you must do what the word says and not just hear it. Otherwise, you would be like a man who looked in the mirror, saw what he needed to do, and did nothing. It is the one who does God's will, who is pleasing to God. So you can, you know, you can read about it, study about it, even pray about it. But if you don't do it, what have you accomplished? And so you look in the mirror. You look at God's Word. It's like, picture it as a mirror. And there it's saying, you know, for instance, uh, as we have just said, I uh, let, you know, be uh, quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to write. And, oh, yeah, I'm bad about that. Uh, I, I need to, you know, that's me right there. And then you close it up, go away, and you're still not swift to listen. You're still quick to wrath and so on. It hasn't done you any good. You may look in there and see the importance of loving your brother, of forgiving your brother, and you see that and you just, um, you still don't love your brother or forgive your brother. It's done you no good at all. It's the one who does God's will that's pleasing to God. 
And so, as we get into chapter 2 then, I mentioned this very scenario just a couple of minutes ago. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with partiality. Then he talks about somebody comes in your assembly and one's dressed really great and one's not. Which one do you pay the most attention to? Which one are you so glad is there? Oh, come back and see us again. And which one do you kind of just shy away from, maybe? He said, oh, no, don't do that. He said, God chose the poor of this world to be rich in faith. Isn't it the rich who oppress you and speak against Christianity? James is reasoning with them to say, why should you show them favor or preference? It makes no sense. And so we need to be careful about our, our motives and about what influences us and what kind of prejudices us. It, it may be a race issue. It, it may be a, a financial issue. Don't let it cloud our judgment. Treat brethren equally, is what he's saying. The Bible teaches us in several places in here not to show respect of persons. And that's the very thing that we were just discussing. And so, why, um, he says, now here, here's, connect that now. Here's the royal law. He says, this, this is what you just, like he says, now listen to this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you do that, you do well. And he just talked about don't show personal favoritism. Don't show respect to persons. You love your neighbor. And the Lord taught the parable of the Good Samaritan to teach us who is our neighbor, remember? And so he says, now don't show respect to persons. And if you do, he says... Why, you commit sin. Isn't that a, a strong statement? That if we show respect to persons, that we commit sin? And then he, he, he lays it out this way. He says, now, sometimes we might judge that one law is not so bad to break, while an, another law, oh, never break that one. But he says, if you break one commandment you're a transgressor of the law you know god let's say god has laws here's god's law we break one whichever one it is we've broken the law and so even if you keep the rest of it you still broke the law in, in whatever way that was Every commandment, James says, is important. Now, we, none of us are going to do it perfectly, but that doesn't excuse us. That just means we need forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, that we have it in Him. So in James chapter 2, and verse 12 and 13, So speak and so act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who shows no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Go back to the to the way we might judge between people based on the way they're dressed or their status or their color or whatever. And, and how we need to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to wrath. And how that if we don't know exactly what to do, ask God and He'll help us to, to know what we ought to do. And so, so speak and so act as those who are going to be judged under the law of liberty. That's Christ's law. He does have a law. But mercy is so important. And we love our neighbor as ourselves. We want mercy. If we receive God's justice, where would we be? The soul that sins, it shall die. You ever sin? The wages of sin is death. Again, have you ever sinned? Then you deserve to die and you, des you deserve death. But what do we want? We want mercy. I'm so thankful we find mercy through Jesus Christ. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Oh, there's a qualifier. The Lord said, if you don't forgive your brother, don't expect to be forgiven. Here, James is just echoing the same thing in a different way. If you don't show mercy, don't expect mercy. And where will we be on the day of judgment without God's mercy? So don't fail to make the connection between showing mercy 
and the treatment of the poor man. I will never succeed in standing justified before God without His mercy, so I must show mercy toward others in my own actions. The passage shows that we cannot pick and choose which commandments to obey. Now, we get to, down to chapter 2 and verse 14. Faith is dead without works. So he says, what good is it if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? It's easy to claim you have faith. It can only be proven or seen by how it's demonstrated. Now, Jesus did that in, in healing people. He would say, which is easier? To say your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk. Well, you could see take up in bed and walk. You couldn't see sins forgiven. Jesus could, but we can. So you cannot see faith apart from works. It can only be proven, seen by how it's demonstrated. You may think you're doing something great when you just believe. You know what he said about that? Well, the demons, the demons also believe and tremble. That, that is pretty uh, an amazing passage to me. You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. That's in chapter 2, verse 19. Would you say demons are going to be saved? They have faith. They have faith alone, though. They don't have works to go with their faith. Abraham... Paul will argue was justified, uh, James rather will argue, was justified by an obedient faith. He offered up Isaac on the altar in Genesis chapter 22. His faith, when coupled with works, was made complete. When he drew back his knife to kill his own son, as God told him to do, and God stopped him, don't harm your son. God didn't want him to offer Isaac, but Abraham didn't know that. And he says, now I know. I mean, God didn't know before about Abraham's faith. Now I know, God says, that you will obey me. And so at this point, the scripture received its full meaning. He was a man of faith. James 2, verse 23, And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. It's easy to say we believe, but we need to show it. Abraham's example proves that the point that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. Now, Rahab is another example. You know, Rahab was a harlot of all things, but the spies that were spying out Jericho come to her door and she lets them in and she hides them. Well, hiding them proved her faith in God. She was justified when she hid the messengers of Israel and helped them to escape. James 2, verse 26, For as the body apart from the Spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Abraham demonstrated the degree of his faith by his actions, thus fulfilling the statement that he believed and was counted righteous. Rahab was a harlot, but her faith in Jehovah caused her to risk her life in order to save the spies. So, We've come to our stopping place here. Thank you again so much for being with us. We're going to continue. Now, we didn't quite finish uh, lesson four, so we'll continue the, the remainder of it next time, Lord willing. Let's keep reading, keep studying, but don't be a hearer only, but be a doer, because that's the one that God's looking for. That's the one who stands justified. His faith is real. It's obedient. It's the living faith. Thank you for being with us. Join us next time as we continue to seek the old path. Coming of the judgment, fairly well, fairly well. I'm going about the coming of the judgment, fairly well, fairly well. There's a better day of coming, fairly well, fairly well. There's a better day of coming, fairly well, fairly well. In that great, again, the morning, fairly well, fairly well. In that great.
great again in the morning fairly well fairly well when you see the lightning flashing fairly well